Swift 5 is finally here, bringing with it ABI stability. But at the same time, there are lots of other great new features in Swift 5, so in this video, I'm going to walk you through all the major ones with hands-on code samples so you can see exactly how they work. Now, you're busy and I'm busy, so let's not waste time. Let's go straight to the first new feature in Swift 5. SE235 introduces a result type into the standard library, giving us a simpler, clearer way of handling errors in complex code, such as asynchronous APIs. Swift's result type is implemented as an enum that has two cases, success and failure. Both are implemented using generics, so they can have associated value of your choosing. But failure must be something that conforms to Swift's error type. To demonstrate result, we can write a function that connects to a server to figure out how many unread messages are waiting for the user. In this example code, we're going to have just one possible error, which is that the requested URL isn't a valid URL. Enum network error conforms to error, Case bad URL. The fetching function will accept a URL string as its first parameter and a completion handler as its second parameter. That completion handler will itself accept a result where the success case will store an integer and the failure case will be some sort of network error. We're not actually going to connect to a server here, but using a completion handler at least lets us simulate asynchronous code. Here's the code func fetch unread count from URL string string completion handler at escaping result int network error returns void. Guard let URL equals URL string URL string else completion handler dot failure dot bad URL return. Otherwise, some sort of complex networking code. Then we'll print out the URL absolute string and call our completion handler with dot success and the value 5. To use that code, we need to check the value inside our result to see whether our call succeeded or failed, like this. Fetch unread count from hackingwithswift.com result in switch result case.success let count print count unread messages case.failure let error print error.localized description. There are three more things you ought to know before you start using result in your own code. First, result has a get method that either returns the successful value if it exists or throws its error otherwise. This allows you to convert result into a regular throwing call like this. Fetch unread count from hackingwithstuff.com result in. If let count equals try question mark result dot get print count unread messages. Second, result has an initializer that accepts a throwing closure. If the closure returns a value successfully, that gets used for the success case. Otherwise, a thrown error is placed into the failure case. For example, let some file equals URL file URL with path path to file. Let result equals result try string contents of some file. Third, rather than using a specific error enum you've created, you can also use the general error protocol. In fact, the Swift Evolution proposal says. It's expected that most uses of result will use Swift or error as the error type argument. So, rather than using result int network error, you could use result int error. Although this means you lose the safety of typed throws, you gain the ability to throw a variety of different error enums. Which you prefer really depends on your coding style. SE230 modifies the way conditional try works so nested optionals are flattened to become regular optionals. This makes it work the same way as optional chaining and conditional typecasts, both of which flatten optionals in earlier Swift versions. Here's a practical example to demonstrate the change. First, we make a user struct. We give it an ID integer and a failable initializer that takes an ID int. And we'll say if the ID it's passed in is zero or negative, we will return nil. Only positive IDs can be used. Otherwise, we'll assign that ID to self.id. Then our simple method will do func get messages, uh, throws errors, returns a string. We'll put in some complicated code here in theory and return no messages. Finally, we'll make an instance of that user. We'll say let user equals a user with the ID of one. And finally, let messages equals try question mark, user question mark, dot get messages. Now this user struct has 
a failable initializer because we want to make sure folks create users with a valid ID. The get messages method would in theory contain some sort of complicated code to get all messages for the user, so it's marked as throws. I've made it return a fixed string here so the code compiles cleanly. The important line is this last one down here. Because the user is optional, it has to use optional chaining, user question mark dot get messages. And because get messages can throw, it uses try question mark to convert the throwing method into an optional. So we end up with a nested optional. The user is optional and the try is optional. In Swift 4.2 and earlier, this would make messages an optional, optional string, a string question mark, question mark. But in Swift 5 and later, try won't wrap values in an optional if they are already optional. So now if you look in code completion, you'll see messages is just a regular optional string. This new behavior matches the existing behavior of optional chaining and conditional typecasting. That is, you could use optional chaining a dozen times in a single line of code if you wanted, but you wouldn't end up with 12 nested optionals. Similarly, if you use optional chaining with as question mark, you would still end up with only one level of optionality, because that's usually what you want. SE200 added the ability to create raw strings, where backslashes and quote marks are interpreted as those literal symbols rather than escape characters or string terminators. This makes a number of use cases more easy, but regular expressions in particular will benefit. To use raw strings, place one or more hash or pound symbols before your string, like this. Let rain equals hash quote, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the Spaniards, quote hash. The hash symbols at the start and end of the string become part of the string delimiter. So Swift understands that the standalone quote marks around rain and Spain should be treated as literal quote marks rather than ending the string in the middle. Raw strings allow you to use backslashes too. Let key paths equals hash quote, Swift key paths such as backslash person.name hold uninvoked references to properties, quote hash. That treats the backslash as being a literal character in the string rather than an escape character. This in turn means that string interpolation works differently. Let answer equals 42. Let dope panic equals the answer to life, the universe and everything is backslash hash parens answer parens. A regular backslash parens answer parens will be interpreted as characters in the string. So when you want string interpolation to happen in a raw string, you must add the extra hash. One of the most interesting features of Swift's raw strings is the use of hash symbols at the start and end, because you can use more than one in the unlikely event you'll need to. It's hard to provide a good example here because it really ought to be extremely rare, but consider this string. My dog said, quote, woof, quote, hash, good dog. Like a hashtag on Twitter. Because there's no space before the hash, Swift will see, quote, hash, and immediately interpret it as a string terminator. In this situation, we need to change our delimiter from hash, quote, to hash, hash, quote, like this. Let stir equals hash hash quote, my dog said, quote woof quote, hashtag good dog, quote hash hash. Notice how the number of hashes at the end must match the number at the start. Raw strings are fully compatible with Swift's multi-line string system. Just use hash quote 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 to start, then quote 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 hash to end, like this. Let multi-line equals hash quote quote quote, the answer to life, the universe and everything is backslash hash parens answer parens. Then to end the string, quote, 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 hash. Being able to do without lots of backslashes will prove particularly useful in regular expressions. For example, writing a simple regex to find key paths such as backslash person.name used to look like this. Let regex1 equals, quote, four backslashes, then at least one uppercase character, then one or more upper or lowercase characters, then two backslashes period, a literal period, then one or more lowercase characters. Thanks to raw strings, we can write the same thing with half the number of backslashes. We still need some, because regular expressions use them too. 
SE216 adds a new dynamic callable attribute to Swift, which brings with it the ability to mark a type as being directly callable. It's syntactic sugar rather than any sort of compiler magic, and is a natural extension of Swift 4.2's dynamic member lookup, and serves the same purpose, to make it easier for Swift code to work alongside dynamic languages like Python and JavaScript. Let's look at an example. First, we'll build a random number generator struct that generates random numbers between zero and a certain maximum, depending on what input was passed in. We'll say struct random number generator func generate number of zeros int returns a double. Let maximum equals pow 10 double number of zeros return double dot random in zero through the maximum. So this method here will generate a random number between zero and some sort of maximum based on number of zeros. So if you say there's only one zero, it'll do one through 10. If you say two zeros, one through 100, three zeros, one through 1,000, and so forth. To switch us over to be dynamically callable, we'd write something like this instead. First, we'd add the at dynamically callable attribute to our struct. So Swift now knows this struct will have dynamically callable behavior. We'll now replace our method signature with this instead. Func dynamically call with keyword arguments, args, a key value pairs of string and int returns a double. And inside there, let's get our number of zeros by saying let number of zeros equals a double of args dot first question mark dot value or zero. And then the maximum's the same and the return value is the same. If you haven't seen key value pairs before, it's a bit like a dictionary, except it's ordered and can have duplicate values. So when we say args dot first question mark dot value, we're saying read the first integer that was passed into this method. Now I'll explain more what this does in a second, but first let's try and use this thing. Let's say, let random equals a random number generator. Let result equals random number of zeros, zero. So as you can see, we're using this type, random number generator, as if it were a function. And we're calling it directly, saying number of zeros, zero. So what's happening here is Swift will convert this parameter name, number of zeros, and its value, zero, into a key value pairs object, where number of zeros will be the string, and zero will be the int. And of course, there could be many of these. We could have number of zeros, zero, formatting style, some sort of string, and so forth. And we'll have many values in our key value pairs. In this instance, though, we're only passing in one parameter, number of zeros, zero. And so we can read the first argument's value, which will be zero. But if that fails, because it's optional, we will just use zero instead. This means we could, if we wanted to, just call random directly with no parameter names attached to it. Now there is another alternative. This thing here is the with keyword arguments version of dynamic callable. There's a second version called with arguments. Comment out this code. I instead say func dynamically call with arguments args is going to be an array of integer. No more key value pairs now, but it still returns a double. We'll say let number of zeros be equal to a double of args zero. Let maximum equals pow 10 number of zeros and return double dot random in zero through maximum. So it's very similar. But you can see the method signature is slightly different. Because we're now saying this thing takes an unnamed array of arguments. They're not keyword arguments anymore. They're just simple arguments with no names attached to them. So before we called random with number of zero, zero. Now we just say random zero. And that gets put into this method here as array of integers, in this case, just a zero, convert it to a double, use with pow, and then make a random number from that instead. Now I should say, you can, if you want, 
have both of these active at the same time. So you can use keyword arguments or without keyword arguments instead, depending on what you need. Now there are some important rules to be aware of when using dynamic callable. Uh, you can apply it to structs, enums, classes, and protocols. If you implement with keyword arguments and don't implement with arguments, your type can still be called without parameter labels. But what will happen is this string here will just be empty. You'll get empty strings for the keys. If your implementations of with keyword arguments or with arguments are marked as throwing, calling the type will also be throwing. This attribute here, at dynamic callable, you can't add that to an extension, only the primary definition of a type, like we have here, this struct. And most importantly, you can still add regular methods and properties to your type and use them as normal. At this point though, there is no support for method resolution, which means you must call the type directly. We say random zero or random number of zeros, like this, five, rather than calling specific methods. So we can't say at this point, random.generate number of zeros, five. We can't do that yet. Hopefully that'll come in the future. There's already some discussion about it on the Swift Evolution forums. In the meantime, dynamic callable is not likely to be widely popular, but it is hugely important for a small number of people who want interactivity with Python, JavaScript, and other languages. SE225 adds an is multiple of method to integers, allowing us to check whether one number is a multiple of another in a much clearer way than using the division remainder operation, percent. For example, let row number equals four, if row number is multiple of two, then print even, else print odd. Yes, we could write that same check using if row number percent two equals zero, but you have to admit that's less clear. Having is multiple of as a method means it can be listed in co-completion options in Xcode, which aids discoverability. SE228 dramatically revamped Swift's string interpolation system so it's more efficient and more flexible and it's creating a whole new range of features that were previously impossible. In its most basic form, the new string interpolation system lets us control how objects appear in strings. Swift has default behavior for structs that's help over debugging, because it prints the struct name followed by all its properties. But if you're working with classes that don't have this behavior, or wanted to format the output so it could be user-facing, then you could use the new string interpolation system. For example, if we had a struct like this one, struct user, var name string and var age int. If you wanted to add a custom string interpolation for that, so we printed users neatly, we could add an extension to string.string .string interpolation with a new append interpolation method. Swift already has several of these built in and uses the interpolation type, in this case user, to figure out which method to call. In this case, we're going to add an implementation that puts user's name and age into a single string then calls one of the built-in append interpolation methods to add that to our string, like this. We'll say extension string dot string interpolation, mutating func, append interpolation, accepts a value, which is a user. Inside there we'll call append interpolation directly and say, my name is string interpolation value dot name and I'm string interpolation value.age. So this thing here will be called whenever we try and use interpolation with a user. For example, you could write this. Let user equal to new user with the name Guybrush Threepwood, the age of 33, and then print user details, string interpolation, user, like that. And when that code runs, it'll print out my name is Guybrush Threepwood, and I'm 33. Let's try it now. I'll press play. Boom, exactly right. Of course, that functionality is no different from just implementing the custom string convertible protocol. So let's move on to some more advanced usages. Your custom interpolation method can take as many parameters as you need, labeled or unlabeled. For example, we can add an interpolation to print numbers using various styles, like this. We could say extension, String dot string interpolation, mutating func, append interpolation, accepts an unnamed parameter called number, which is an integer, and a style, 
which is their number formatter dot style. Inside there, we'll make a formatter object by saying let formatter equals a number formatter. Assign that the number style given to uh, our parameter style. And then try and read the result from that formatter using the number that was passed in. So we'll say if let result equals formatter dot string from the number that was passed in. As a typecast as an NS number for reasons, as NS number, thanks Swift. And then call append interpolation of that result to pass it into our main string again. And now we can try and use that. So let's say something like uh, let number is int dot random in zero through a hundred. Let lucky equals the lucky number this week is oops number this week is string interpolation number style colon dot spell out my personal favorite style and then print lucky. And now when the code runs, we'll see that printed out as hopefully it's spelled out. There we go. Eight. So it says the lucky number this week is eight. Because it's random every time, I stop it again and play it back. We'll get a different number. Ten. I go again. Eighty-eight and so forth. So that's working really nicely. You can call a pen interpolation as many times as you need, or even not at all if necessary. For example, we could add a string interpolation to repeat a string multiple lines like this. We could say... Uh, extension string dot string interpolation mutating func append interpolation this time we'll pass in a name parameter called repeat inside we'll call it a stir it is a string second parameter will be unnamed in turn we'll call that count and int we'll say here for underscore in zero up to excluding count append interpolation Stir. And now I can print out uh, print baby shark string interpolation repeating do six times like that. Then end the string. And when that code runs, we should see baby shark do 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 do. It's like in the song right there. Amazing. And as these things are just regular methods, we can use Swift's full range of functionality. For example, we might add an interpolation that joins an array of strings together. But if that array is empty, execute a closure that returns a string instead. So we say this uh, extension string dot string interpolation, mutating func, append interpolation. This time, we'll pass in the values array of strings. The second parameter will be an empty value with whatever default value is going to be. This is going to be at auto closure accepts no params, returns a string. Inside there we can write, if values.count is zero, then append interpolation, default value. Else, if values aren't nil, we will append interpolation, values.joined, with the separator, comma, and space. And now we can say, let names equals Harry and... Uh, Ron and Hermione and print list of students those names with the empty value being uh, a string saying no one like that then end the uh, string like that I hope when that runs we should see list of students Harry Ron Hermione Now this happened to be empty if this were an empty array of strings uh, like that string if I play that back we should see no one instead Boom, just like that. Now using the auto closure up here matters. It means we can use simple values like no one or call complex functions to calculate that default value. But none of that work will be done unless values.count is zero. For something really big, we can combine expressible by string literal and expressible by string interpolation to create whole new types using string interpolation. And if we add custom string convertible, we can even make those types print as strings however we want to. To make this work, we need to fulfill some specific criteria. First, whatever type we create should conform to expressible by string literal, expressible by string interpolation, and custom string convertible. The latter is only needed if you want to customize the way the type is printed. 
Inside your type needs to be a nested struct called string interpolation that conforms to string interpolation protocol. The nested struct needs to have an initializer that accepts two integers, telling us roughly how much data it can expect. It also needs to implement an append literal method, as well as one or more append interpolation methods. And finally, your main type needs to have two initializers that allow it to be created from string literals and string interpolations. We can put all that together into an example type that can construct HTML from various common elements. The nested string interpolation struct is like a scratch pad. Each time a new literal or interpolation is added, we'll append it to our scratch pad string. To help you see exactly what's going on, I've added some print calls inside the various append methods so you can watch it playback as you run the code. We'll say struct HTML component conforms to expressible by string literal and expressible by string interpolation and custom string convertible. Inside there is a nested struct, nested struct string interpolation, which itself conforms to string interpolation protocol. That's our scratch pad right there. And it's going to start off with an empty string. So we'll have here, uh, start with an empty string. Var output is an empty string. Next, we have our initializer, how much space to reserve. This thing here will uh, allocate enough space to hold twice the amount of literal text we're given. So we'll say init, literal capacity, int, interpolation count, int. I'm going to write output dot reserve capacity, literal capacity times two. This will tell us how much literal string to expect, like 50 characters, for example. And this will tell us how many interpolations to expect. So it could be a name interpolation, an age interpolation, and more. That tells us how many to expect. Next, we'll add the append literal method. This is going to be some sort of uh, hard-coded text. But we're just going to add it. So we'll say mutating func append literal. This is uh, a literal string. So it's just like the word hello, for example. I'm going to print that out so we can see what's going on. So we'll do print appending that string. Then append that to our main string, our property string. So we'll call output.append literal. Next, we'll add a method that appends Twitter names, Twitter usernames to the thing as HTML. So this will do uh, a Twitter username, add it as a link. So we'll say mutating func, append interpolation, uh, a Twitter string. So it will be two straws, for example, my username at Twitter. So we'll do print uh, appending Twitter, so we can see what's going on, like that. And then output.append, I'll try and do some HTML here. We have ahref equals backslash quote, https colon slash slash twitter.com slash that username, so Twitter. Then end the quote, backslash quote, then an at symbol, then the Twitter handle again, so it'll be at two straws, then end the A and end the string. Next, we're going to add an email address. Uh, so I'll do this one. It will be an email address, add it using mail2, which is the web form of doing mail links. So we'll say using func, append interpolation, email string. Print. Again, we'll print it to the screen so we can see what's going on. Appending email account. Then output.append a href equals uh, backslash quote mail to and then I'll have my email address in there so I'll do uh, email backslash quote and the a and again the email there so it'll do mail to paul at hackingsworth.com and then end that and say paul at hackingsworth.com like that and the string boom so that ends our nested struct the inner struct we're now going to leave this struct here this inner struct and, and go below it into our main struct, that's the HTML component struct here, and add a few things here. So this will have a property for uh, the finished text for this whole uh, component. We'll store that as a property called description, which is a string. Then there's two methods to implement, to initialize the implement. One is when a string little is given to us, and here's some raw text, what do you want to do? 
as so we'll say init with a string literal value of a string. Uh, if that happens, I'll just make our description string be equal to that value string. Just copy the raw, list, raw literal string across, that's all we're doing. Uh, so that is when we want to create an instance from a literal string. The second one though, is when we want to create an instance from an interpolated string using all, all those methods above. So we'll say init with string interpolation, our string interpolation object, that's our nested struct. We can say description is equal to that string interpolation object output, its scratch pad variable. Copy that into our main thing. So now we can create and use that thing immediately with some code. We can say let text as some sort of HTML component equal to uh, you should follow me on Twitter. And I'll do uh, string interpolation Twitter colon two straws. So my Twitter account comma, or you can email me at, and then you do string interpolation again. This time we'll say email uh, is paul at hackingwithswift.com, like that. Then end the string in interpolation, like that. And hopefully that will all work nicely. We can do uh, print text, and we should get back from that fully formatted HTML, boom. So as you can see there, we have, you should follow me on Twitter with Twitter link, uh, or email me at a mail to HTML link. Just above, if you look at the output here, you will see how it's actually working. So you can see it's appending, you should follow me on Twitter, then two straws, or you can email me at, then the email address, and then a full sample period at the end. And that is all those print calls, these guys are through it, these things up here, appending, appending, uh, and appending. Uh, these print out the literal, the Twitter, or the mail to links, so you can see exactly how it's putting the whole string together. SE218 adds a new compact map values method to dictionaries, bringing together the compact map functionality from arrays, transform my values, unmap the results, then discard anything that's nil, with the map values method from dictionaries, leave my keys intact, but transform my values. As an example, here's a dictionary of people in a race, along with the times they took to finish in seconds. One person did not finish, marked as DNF. Let times equals, open bracket, Hudson 38, Clark 42, Robinson 35, Hartis DNF. We can use compact map values to create a new dictionary with names and times as an integer, with the one DNF person removed. Let finishers1 equals times.compactMapValues int $0. Alternatively, you could just pass the int initializer directly to compact map values like this. Let finishers2 equals times dot compact map values int dot init. You can also use compact map values to unwrap optionals and discard nil values without performing any sort of transformation, like this. Let people equals open bracket Paul thirty eight, Sophie eight, Charlotte five, William nil. Then let known ages equals people dot compact map values dollar zero. SE192 adds the ability to distinguish between enums that are fixed and enums that might change in the future. One of Swift's security features is that it requires all switch statements to be exhaustive. They must cover all cases. While this works well from a safety perspective, it causes compatibility issues when new cases are added in the future. A system framework might send something back that you hadn't catered for or code you rely on might add a new case and cause your compile to break because your switch is no longer exhaustive. With this new at unknown attribute, we can now distinguish between two subtly different scenarios. This default case should be run for all other cases because I don't want to handle them individually. And I want to handle all cases individually, but if anything else comes up in the future, use this rather than causing an error. Let's try it out. Here's an example enum. enum Password error, conforms to error. Case short, case obvious, case simple. So those are our three cases we'll be using. We could write code to handle each of those cases using a switch block. We could say uh, func show old error password error. Switch error, case short, print your password was too short. 
Uh, case obvious. Print your password was too obvious. And then default, rather than doing case simple, print your password was too simple. So this uses two explicit cases for short and obvious passwords, but bundles a third case into this default block down here. Now, if in the future we added a new case of the enum called old for passwords that had been used previously, our default case would automatically be called even though its message doesn't really make sense. The password might not be too simple. Swift can't warn us about this code because it's technically correct, the best kind of correct. So this mistake would be easily missed. Fortunately, the new at unknown attribute fixes this perfectly. It can only be used on the default case and it's designed to be run when new cases come along in the future. So we have case short, we have case obvious. I'm now going to say at unknown default and say instead your password wasn't suitable. That code will now issue warnings because the switch block is no longer exhaustive. Swift wants us to handle each case explicitly. Helpfully, this is only a warning, which is what makes this attribute so useful. If a framework adds a new case in the future, you'll be warned about it, but it won't break your code. So as you've seen, there are lots of great new features coming in Swift 5, but which one are you most keen to use in your own code? Leave a comment below, let me know. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I make lots more videos like this one to help you improve your skills as an iOS developer.